Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Resilient Voices. We have Joe Paul in the house, one of the OG Jewish rappers that have changed the entire world. Right now, he's full-time Israel advocate and Jewish advocate and fighting for everybody out there. Uh, Joe, I'm super excited for what you're doing. I'm super, I'm super proud of what you're doing. I'm so honored to be a part of this and to, uh, to actually host you on this podcast. I've seen your content for a long time. Uh, I've been following you for 15, 20 years, which is aging you and aging my dad, definitely. My dad's been following you since you were born, um, but we're really excited to have you on. So Joe, uh, give us a little bit of your background. I got a lot of questions and we got some topical stuff to talk about today. Awesome. Well, thank you for the amazing uh, intro. Um, hopefully I um, you know, meet your expectations for you know the, the marvelous intro that you just gave me. But uh, I go by the name of Joe Paul. Uh, uh, originally in the music industry for over 25 years, I you know switched lanes and used my platform, my voice, and my talents to try to help the Jewish people you know rediscover who they are, let them know you know who they're perceived to be and who we have to be moving forward in the future. So basically, using my I don't know New York swagger and my you know hip hop persona and my unapologetic you know real just realness, I just tell it how it is, and if you don't like it, you can get the fuck out of here. Did you get a lot of pushback from your original community that now yes. that you're talking about Israel? What 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 type of pushback and why pushback? Um, because like a majority of the people, they were influenced by a lot of the visual propaganda. This is a, a psych uh, we've never seen psychological warfare on this level before, nor have we seen a war that's so polarized and in your face and reported in real time by actual regular people rather than just the media outlets or the C-SPANs or the, you know, the Fox and CNNs. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, you know, I would just disagree before you go on. I would just disagree with that. We have seen that. It's just now we're noticing it before it was my more subtle, more secret. It was behind the scenes, but now we've got more people like yourself that are pointing it out, that are bringing it up. And we've had a number of people on the podcast that to mention it. And I think now our, generation of jews is more is more aware of it and but i think it's been going on for years and years and years yeah what i what i meant by that let me just clarify it and yes you're absolutely right what i meant is the actual scenage of warfare like we uh like for the iraq war and afghanistan war yeah we watched you know c-span and we watched the, at night we could see like the missiles and the bullets flying but we've never seen like like really what happened that day and the building falling down and they take whether it's a prop baby or it's a real baby or they meant for it to happen. You know, the reason that I got so much pushback is because you can't deny seeing a dead baby being pulled out of the rubble, whether that is, you know, meant for you to see or not meant for you to see in terms of social media. Our brains are not meant to see that. So we don't know how to really um we don't know really how to analyze what it is that we're seeing. All we associate that with is, oh, my God, dead baby, bad. Israel must be doing something wrong. So uh, along with the I mean, they're they're just fucking phenomenal at it. Their their propaganda, um, you know, digital warfare and how they're actually able to to perform in that manner. It unfortunately, it reached the eyes of a lot of people that, you know, I was very close with that. I would would call friends. Some I'd even call family that. I no longer will speak to, and probably if we see each other on the street, it's probably going to go down. Really, you think it's you think it's gotten that bad that they think? Well, but well, well I, I mean, know it's gotten that not, bad. Well, listen, when you call, if you call me Hitler, or you tell me that I'm that I'm supporting genocide, or that you know uh, God is going to you know uh, is going to you know uh, cast judgment upon me, you know, uh, you know, on my day of reckoning, it's like, all right, well, I, maybe I want to meet him now. So why don't you try to introduce him to me? I mean, look, that's really been uh, that's really been a big problem is that is that they they're taking and it's also it's funny because it's like, oh, well, this is an Israel problem, but you're living in America. What is what is your advocacy for like Jewish and, and what's going on around the world? What does that have to do with with Hitler? Like, what does that have to do with anything? But it's this lack of consistency between the hatred against Israel and it's the Jews versus what's actually the reality is right now. I think there's a lot of bias against Jews. Let's talk for a second um, about last night and and two or will be two weeks ago at the DNC, the uh, the Hirsch goal. Um, yeah, I, I want to Oh, yeah, Rachel I just want to say his name is Hirsch. When I heard Hirsch. that, like the tears just started falling and I was like, finally, I was like, it doesn't matter what side of the political landscape you're on. The whole objective is to get the fucking hostages home, to end Hamas 
and to bring an end to the, I, I'd like to say a hundred years, but it's, it's much, much longer than that. This is a, this is going on since the creation of Islam and Muhammad in the seventh century, where Jews have always been looked at as demis and second class citizens, other than, you know, when, you know, a brief period, you know, in the, the mid 1800s when Islamic reform happened and Jews were actually kind of treated sort of equal, but sort of not. But we can get into that. So it's, um, it, it's a it's a crazy from world from a religious perspective it goes back to you know abraham isaac asa you know that built into creation that this yeah. anti-semitism right it's it's, it's, like, it's like who's the real who's yeah. the real, real who's the real patriarch of you know the people is it you know isaac or is it ishmael who came first you know and so but i bring that i bring that up to say that it's it's not it should not be within the political landscape to get american hostages home and the lack of messaging from our administration and this is not a an attack on democrats this is not you know a uh, a one up for republicans but the lack of messaging from our administration to put pressure on the people of gaza palestine hamas qatar whoever is the controlling body or who actually is the decision maker to not put that pressure on them to release american hostage hostages is something that history is not going to look too fond of well, they think that if there's a complete ceasefire right now, that means that means we completely stop this whole thing. We just say, oh, freeze. OK, we're going to stop. And then the hostages will come home and then there's working to a better peace, be, a better, but to a better peace. But the, the difference with the hostages is that one side looks at it as leverage, that this is the reason why they're able to continue and they're able to actually control Israel. And the other side says, OK, well, you you clearly are not a partner for peace. And you clearly don't want anything because you're still holding hostages. You're not doing anything in good faith. You're just doing everything negative. And that's a real problem. So it's, it's, it's two lenses. And that's what this whole thing has become. It's two lenses of every perspective. The same thing in, in, on the Israel side. There's the do whatever you have to do today to bring the hostages home. We'll deal with Hamas later. Or let's deal with Hamas now. Let's put a lot of pressure on Hamas right now. And then through that, we'll get the hostages home. And it's become a big divide in the country. What side are you seeing it on? I'm seeing it on all sides. I mean, a year and a half ago, if you told me that I would be swearing off CNN and listening to some of the Republican speakers, I would have told you, you're out of your fucking mind. And we should probably go into the street and fight right now. Don't ever fucking you know, insult me like that. But at the same time, I witnessed it right in front of my eyes where the reporting uh, without substantiation has just gone absolutely fucking insane. And me being, you know, uh, now a, a journalist in my new, you know, my new, um, you know, found walk of life, you know, with um, my verified podcast and how I communicate with all my people, you know, integrity is the main objective in journalistic integrity. And if you just basically are looking to be a, a clickbaiter and just run with a headline like Dewey defeats Truman, then you're no better than the fucking Hamas people. Meanwhile, you're peddling and propagating the Hamas propaganda that has been taken basically out of the air and thrown into the universe as if it's to be the truth. And we're supposed to believe the Gaza Ministry of Health run by Hamas. And this is what all the fucking NGOs and the um, and the Associated Press and The Guardian and Amnesty International. I, I used to swear by, you know, these people to get the truth from these actual companies. But now you have to dive deeper and now you'll find more truth in like an X account or like on Instagram through honest reporting. So it's um it's become it's become quite fucking confusing out there. So what side am I yeah. seeing it on? Uh, everything. Yeah, I don't believe anything I read in the media. And just as an aside, I don't know if you ear knew that Dewey beats Truman reference. So before I did not his, know. It's it's a little bit before his time. I, I apologize. Yeah, I'm, I'm such a sponge for history. So uh, when I when, got it, I understood it. Good. I'm glad. Well, so. you guys, you guys, you, you tried to pull me down, but you aged yourselves. I'm OK with that. I accept who I am. And I don't. I, I don't. But I'm but I'm dealing with it. <laughs> you're, you're getting through it. Uh, uh, and it was, what the, the reference was um, when uh, when Dewey um, was going against uh, Truman for the presidency, they thought that Dewey was going to win, you know, unequivocally and you know mistakenly they printed the newspaper you know as if they thought that he was going to win so it's the greatest misprint of all times you know and would be considered propaganda because it's like 
you know, we're trying to convince the world that, okay, listen, Dewey did actually defeat Truman, but Truman won the election. So it's a travesty. So that's what I'm trying to say. That's where the parallels are. It is, it's like, it is it's like you know, Trump came out, you know, I don't know what you feel about him or whatever, but he comes out with fake news. So when he first started about talking about fake news, oh, that's just another Trump talking, you know, whatever. But then as we get involved, more involved in this, we see all the fake news. It's like crazy the way that they that they disseminate it. And it's just, it's like ridiculous. Yeah, the, oh. the one big thing when I saw when um, when we rescued hostages and the world reported that they were released, I li- I literally fucking went nuts because I was just like, this is this is the craziest thing in the fucking world. How do you like? It is a very very different distinction between released and rescued. Released means that the Captors have actually released the people in captivity from their shackles and restraints of bondage. I know I'm getting a little like, you know, half Torah, you know, I mean, um, <laughs> Haggadah from, from Passover, but you know, it, it is the same thing. So to, to in contrast, to, to not say that they were rescued by an IDF mission, that they were being held in a fucking Al Jazeera journalist home. And then we're gonna then we're gonna report about how many innocent civilians were killed in the process of this rescue. How innocent it's, were they? Maybe it, they shouldn't have done it. Maybe they shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Did they could take, or did they? There was the, also the report is did Israel notify the people in the surrounding area that they were coming before they rescued it? Of course well, that they would did. have been that would have been a smart idea. Let's do that. Yeah, let's tell the terrorists. Listen, we're coming to get you at, at ten o'clock. Are you gonna be around at ten o'clock for us to rescue? Yeah, be like, yeah, what up? Like, yeah, I'm gonna come by, drop these bombs in a couple hours. You gonna be around? No, I'm also right, gonna, we're gonna drop them of, anyway. I'm gonna send a lot of my troops in also, and they're gonna go hand to hand combat. So just make sure you booby trap everything before that, if you don't mind, and uh, if you can make sure our hostages are there also, I would really appreciate that. Um, you're you're obviously getting a lot of pushback, and you're getting a lot of a, a lot of push a, a lot of. Um, your, your world has changed so drastically in a short amount of time that you went from somebody who loves CNN to now you have to do your own independent search and independent media and independent channel and doing your, your very successful podcast. What do you think the next stage is after this war is for someone like you? That's a great question. I mean, I have no idea if this is going to, all right, let me, let me, how can I say so this without in- sounding yeah. like, like it's, you're so different than everybody else that's doing this. Elon Levy, government spokesperson. Tal Heinrich, government spokesperson. Uh, I mean, there's others, obviously, Tanya Zuckerberg, Lizzie Tavetsky, but they're kind of in it. You, are, you come from out of nowhere, and you're doing this, and you're doing it so successfully. Thank you, man. You know, I appreciate that. Um, it's real. Uh, Israel. I love it. <laughs> um, I have no idea if this is going to catapult me into a different sort of career where you know journalism and broadcasting is going to be my my everyday assignment i mean i still have such a tremendous love for music and writing and i have you know uh, artists that i work with all the time that i really want to see them succeed and there's there's you know travesties and atrocities that are committed in the music industry all the time and i've been you know i've been privy to every single one of them My, my motto is i've been fucked so many times that you don't have to be so it's like I know all the deceptions, I know all the scams. So I like to be able to to help people, you know, in the process. But at the same time, this is like a bigger calling. You know, it's like I have all of this knowledge from all of these years of studying for no reason other than. I, so basically, how I learned all of this shit, I was writing for a couple of artists. One was from Iraq, one was from Jordan, one was from Lebanon, and one was from India. And I started uh, researching their history and like their origins, so I can put it into their music and, you know, make it, you know, uh, a little bit more personal to them. This way they could hire me to do more songs for them and I can make more money. And in the process, I was like, oh, the 12 tribes of Jacob, the lost Jews of Israel. Oh, wait, what am I, this is like Indiana Jones in the last crusade. And I just started learning more and more. And it's like, so I went back to the beginning and I did a full chronological, you know, history of it. And then I became obsessed with the actual conflict because I saw things reported from so many different angles. I saw things disappearing off of Wikipedia right in front of my eyes. I saw things from Wikilinks, you know, basically being changed when I know what the actual history is. And I was like, wait a second, have I been put on this earth to teach the people who the fuck they are? And 
So where do I go from here? Hashem knows. It's a beautiful thing. You know, we'll really we'll see if it's a beautiful thing. I mean, sometimes Hashem has has a way of like teaching you certain ways, you know, that you need to, um, you know, uh, change, you know, what you're doing. So, you know, hopefully it's something good. I can only hope. But you know, I mean, that's where the whole idea of Indiana Jones came from. It came from uh, our, our, the Torah and everything. That came from our history. Of course, Moses, Indiana Jones. I mean, and anyone who okay. says differently, you know, and don't forget, Jesus was Palestinian. Take him outside. Take him outside. <laughs> I thought Columbus was Palestinian also. Uh, wasn't I mean, he was. They, they, they all were. I mean, every single yeah. one of them. Listen, Hashem, Yahweh, was Palestinian. I mean, where he lives, he lives in Palestine. I mean, like he takes his yeah, shit yeah. on the Dome of the Rock. You know, he has a golden bathroom, bathroom where he puts his golden shit in all the time. I mean, we have to respect it. That's why we're not yeah, allowed I mean, to pray there. Well, why would you be able to pray there when it's Palestinian? And also, I mean, I also find you a big white occupier. If you don't mind, if you could stop being such a white occupier, we really appreciate that. I'm sorry. I'll lean towards more towards apartheid next time, but you know, we'll see. We'll oh, see if we have enough time. <laughs> There's only so much time in the day. We only the Jews have only been around for five thousand years or two thousand years. I don't know how how long we've been around. That five thousand years. Yep, over fifty three hundred well, years. 53. See, he knows. Well, that's from the beginning of creation. But, no, but right. when did the Jews, when did the Jewish people actually uh, get established? Well, if, well, we, look at, if we look at the historical record, we want to look at the biblical record or historical, because historical, the the furthest that we can date back the civilization of Jews or the Israelites or the people of Israel, because that's what's actually mentioned. So in 1896, there was a, uh, there was a stone tablet or it's called a stila when, um, when Egypt would uh or the egyptian pharaohs used to go on their conquests and they would take over other villages and other towns because they you know they were in, they had very much imperialistic goals to rule you know a lot of different nations um so they build what's called stillas which is it commemorates their conquests and it looks like the the ten commandments except it's a big giant like stone tablet so the pharaoh merneptha which actually the the story of pharaoh ramses is actually based off of so the pharaoh merneptha stilla which was discovered in 1896 dates back to 1253 bc which clearly says the people of israel sleep meaning that he he actually took over the people that were there so that's the first mention of Israel or the Jewish people that we can date back to practically 2000 years before Muhammad and Islam was even created yeah i mean there was always there was always a conversation that that it, it, Jews were first then it transferred over like the Christians were next and then from the Christians there was Muhammad and 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 Islam was created the first three were, centuries of Christians were Jews like i mean like, 100%. And, 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 and to tell you the truth, I mean, obviously, you know, if you go according to, you know, what we believe, you know, as, you know, a Jewish man that mar that doesn't marry a Jewish woman, their kids are no longer Jewish. So um, there was a lot of, you know, Jewish to Jewish, you know, marriages and um, and consummations for the first three centuries. So a majority of Christians, as well as Palestinians, if they do a DNA test, they will see that they have ancestral Jewish blood or, or come from an ancestral Jewish bloodline. I always say that yeah. the, the Palestinians are just Jews, Arabs, and Christians that were Romanized, Hellenized, Islamicized, that just lost their way. That's true. That's, it, it, it's true. I mean, also, I mean, they're going to have to do some work to get back to their roots, but that's, that's really a big issue. Are you finding right now that people are listening more to you than they did before? Like, have you felt that your your career has propelled more because you've decided to take this stance? My career? I mean, so I could say, I could say this, well, from an analytic standpoint, I've never, uh, this is going to sound weird because it's like, I'm not, I'm not trying to boast. I'm just trying to report as it actually is. I've never been as popping as I am now when I wasn't hip hop. Like, I mean, I'm like my page right now, like I have like, 275,000 accounts seen in the last 30 days. And it's been like that for probably the past like five months. Whereas when I was in hip hop, it was like 3000, you know, people, you know, see your account in 30 days when it comes to the views on my videos and, you know, on my stories and the, just the amount of comments and DMS and the love that I get, like I got people calling me professor. Like, so that in itself, that I would that I would consider a win more than anything because I've been recognized for you know how my ability to make songs, my ability to write, my ability to twist words, and you know I'm one of the, I mean this is just me you know 
hosting and be like, I'm one of the best lyricists. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the you best. I'm, I'm one of the best lyricists that you've probably ever heard. And the way that I can, the way that I can twist words and put things together in a, you know, with double and triple and quadruple entendres will make your fucking mind just go crazy. But has it advanced my career? It's advanced. Uh, it's Adventure advanced the, the the belief in myself. The, the belief in myself that eventually I will be successful like I'd like to be. So whether whether that's, you know, being able to convey all of this knowledge that I've learned over the past 10 years to the people that have really need it that might affect, you know, some people's change. I might not change the world, but I feel like I might inspire the person that does. Good. So so let me ask you this. Let's talk about these I am uh you know, as a Jew, Jews, you know, those as a Jew, like as a Jew, I can yeah. say whatever I want and dickheads. criticize other people. Yeah, yeah dickheads. It, it, capo, I view them. But yes, dickheads is a good is a good term for it. I mean, jerk off. I mean, schmuck. Ass I, I face. I mean, yeah, there's like, a bunch of them out there. There's a lot. There's a lot of it. So so I've had the position of, number one, you, you think that the Jewish people, like, I think they're manipulated that the Jewish people are a lot more powerful than we actually are. So, so Jews need to then attack Jews to bring us lower, which we're really not, we're really not that powerful. Like we're strong, but we're not that powerful that we control the weather and the media and the this and the that. What are you saying to those people who actually, they're Jewish and they're, and they're criticizing what's currently going on? Suck my that's- kosher circumcised cock, you pieces of shit. I mean, that's the, that, I mean, that's the harshest you really way. Think. Don't, don't hide your feelings. Just tell us what that's you right. really think. Uh, really? Um. I'd love to have a conversation with their parents. They were not raised in the proper manner. They have not embraced who they actually are. They don't know who they are. And if they knew who they were, they would shut the fuck up and they would sit down. They have no fucking idea that not even a hundred years ago, our people were practically wiped off the map. The people that migrated to this country were penniless and they escaped persecution from Every single fucking place that they even tried to settle. None of us are from Poland. None of us are from Ukraine. None of us are from Russia. We were trapped there during the Pale of Settlement and the May Laws where we were basically bouncing around from town to town because nobody wanted us there. And when we thought that we wanted to establish ourselves, they denied us. They denied us citizenship. They denied us livelihood. They denied us the ability to migrate and immigrate elsewhere. Not only that, but they took our children and forced conscription them for 35 years to make them join the Russian Orthodox military. And you never got to see your family again. So you've been indoctrinated and you've lost your identity completely. And that's been going on for generation after generation after generation. And people knew who the fuck the Jews actually were and who they were, you know, inside themselves. They would shut the fuck up with this. As a Jew, I feel like this. And as a Jew, I feel like that. Well, as this type of Jew, I feel like smacking you and your parents in your fucking faces. Well, yeah, well, I, I find it's a lack of they have internal issues. They have internal like mental problems. I, I would say, let's say anxiety, depression and things like that. And very it's, easy it's, to- an, it's an identity crisis of the, of the of a biblical proportion, because it to deny, to deny who you are and who your people are is not to. And this is why I speak like this, because as of 10 years ago, there, this is a funny story. Actually, I was talking to some girl online and she was um, trying to convince me to pay for a plane ticket for her to fly into New York. And I, you know, I like she, I mean, it, she just wasn't my flavor enough to do that. I mean, if she would have been here, I mean, I probably would have smashed her. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just, you know, I'm just being honest, but I didn't want to, you know, I wasn't going to pay for it. And then all of a sudden she turned into fucking psycho when she was like this, you know, you fucking cheap Jew, you know, you dirty kike that you guys should have fucking all, all, all fucking died when you were in Spain. And I was like, I was like, wait, I was like, what Spain. You, I was like, Spain, what the fuck are you talking about? And it was that moment when I was like, why the fuck did she say that? And one, one it, it like clued me into how anti-Semitic people really were. But then it was like, I don't know that we were ever in Spain. And then I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I was like, so we were expelled? Yeah, we, we, we actually were in Spain and in Portugal. And that's where the Sephardic Jews came from. And, and it was the wealth that was basically stolen by the Spanish, by Isabel and Ferdinand, when they expelled the Jews in 1492. And they kicked out all the Jews from Spain and Portugal that actually was able to fund Christopher Columbus sailing to America. Yeah, the Jews, they've been financing things for, their, for the entire, you know, since the world was existed. But it was yeah. stolen money that basically founded America. The Jews stolen money that once they were expelled from 
from Spain, all of their wealth and all of their belongings was sacked by the Spanish. So when I found out that we were from Spain, that's when I had it. I was like, somebody knows more than I do. This is before I even started learning. And that's what triggered me. I was like, I never want to get caught with that ever again. You know, I mean, if I would have known then what I know now, I'd have been like, let me tell you about Spain. You should thank your lucky fucking stripes that we didn't fucking stay in Spain because that's how America was founded. And that's the way Canada was founded because the French and the British, you know, set up colonies, you know, all along from, you know, Toronto all the way down to Florida, to St. Augustine with, with the Spanish. So it was because of the Jews money that we left behind when we were kicked out is the whole reason America was even founded. You dickhead. Let me give you a concept that that, you know, it could be religious, whatever you want to think it, take it. But. The, the way that we look at it from the religious point of view is that the whole reason of God putting anti-Semitism in the world is exactly for that response that you had, is to remind us who we are, and if we don't know who we are, to find out about us, and that's why the anti you feel like, oh, it's just hate, it's coming against us, but on a on a higher, like, maybe spiritual level, I don't want to get too esoteric, it gets a little crazy when I do, but the whole concept, and it's amazing for me to watch it, is the whole reason of anti-Semitism is for you to be to be bothered enough to find out who you are, which is exactly what happened. I agree. It's also a very it's very interesting that you were able to most people would take it and just go like, well, block that crazo and then just move on. But you went, you know what? You actually have a very valid point. Let's talk about the Spanish thing. And I really want to be able to rebuttal you back. Yeah, but he doesn't like anybody knowing something that he doesn't know. That's what's that's that's the whole thing. You know, something well, yeah, I, was, know. Yeah, I, I was shocked. I was like, wait a second. I was like, what the fuck does Spain have to do with the Jews? You know, and if and, and I brought oh, all that up because <clears throat> because if I don't know that that means you don't know that that means that everybody doesn't know that. And you, and you want to know what got us into this mess? Laziness. You want to know why? You know, the expression when we sit down at the holiday table to eat our holiday meal. They tried to kill us. We survived. Let's eat. Instead of actually going through the story yeah, of all much, of that. It, it's too much deli meat. It makes you tired. I see what you're saying. You're talking about like itis from eating too much meat. So it's like, oh, they tried to kill us. Let's have a pastrami sandwich. And now I'm exhausted and I can't. Well, and it, it's, I it, it's, more, it's more like, it, it's more like <laughs> our uncles have diddled us for the entire, for the entire millennium. Let's stop talking about it. We know that it happened. Let's not get into the specifics and let's try to move past it. And it's that and that sweeping under the rug has what got is what got us into this mess. Because do you know that in 1956, the Roman Catholic Church put out a decree, basically an an apology for 2000 years of convincing the world that the Jews killed Jesus? Sure. That's very nice of them. Sure. See why doesn't second. everybody in the world know this? Why did in the eighties when I grew up? Why was I getting bullied by kids saying, you know, the Jews killed Jesus? Don't play with them. Like yeah. it's well, the, it's the, this propaganda that literally stems so it, it goes. These blood libels run so deep. The fact that we don't talk about it is the reason why we're in this mess. We don't reflect how we should with the real history of what it is. I mean, it's a great concept, you know, to, you know, next year in Jerusalem, you know, uh, you know, and by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept, you know, but it's like, what actually happened? What brought us to that level? Who the fuck are we? And that's what I'm here to do. Yeah, well, it's, you're actually taking a different perspective of really what everybody else is doing and which is why. So you're speaking to so many people, which is the same thing with us. I mean, we're financial, we're financial advisors. We talk about money all the time. That's really oh, our gee, main. We, we could, I was a relationship manager for JP Morgan for 10 years. We could talk about finance okay, and business, you know. Yeah, we, we could talk about that for, I mean, that's really like our main thing. And then, and then next thing you know, people are like, well, then clients of ours are talking to us and being like, hey, I actually didn't know this history about the Jews. I didn't really understand, like, what is Hamas? Hamas is a subject of the Muslim Brotherhood. What is Students for Justice of Palestine? What does that have to do with this? Why is Egypt not letting them in? Why is Saudi Arabia being in talks of actually being the people that are going in, are going into Gaza and cleaning it up? It's fine. And, I, and I just answered every one of those questions in my head. I was just like, blah, 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 and then I went to the next yeah. one. So, <laughs> and, and, and that's really the whole thing. So, so I, I, I find that it, it's so interesting to learn and, and a really great podcast that we launched uh, with Harel Halewi or Harel Khoreb. It's one of the earlier podcasts on the Resilient Riches uh, podcast. 
talks specifically about these types of things. And most people don't even know. So when I'm going and talking to people, they're going, well, what is Hamas? And I'm like, what do you mean? What is like, what do you mean? What is Hamas? They're a subsect of a, of a, of a basically like a cult like section of the, of the Islamic movement that was kicked out of Egypt. They were in power and now they're a big problem, and now nobody wants them because they cause a lot of problems and they cause a lot of death, and it's really yeah. a big issue. Yeah, they so, they, co- they cooed Fatah with the with the Palestinian Authority. They they took over Gaza. You know, as of two thousand five, two thousand six, they basically killed all of all of their government officials. You know, from Fatah, threw them off the roof, and assumed power, and has not had an election since. Yeah, they're very good at and and they're very good at it. And what who is Students for Justice of Palestine? Students for Justice of Palestine for our audience that's listening. Are Hamas Jr. Muslim, they're they're Muslim Hamas, they're Hamas Jr. That's it. They're, they're, they're literally Hamas they're Jr. Even, they're, they're convicted Muslim Brotherhood members that are leading students for justice of Palestine and Palestinian for this and Palestinian for that. It's like you're, you're being run by terrorists, like actual confirmed terrorist associations. No wonder why they're saying death to America, because America is the one that labeled them as terrorists. Why wouldn't they? It's like a fight back. It, it, it just it, it boggles my it blows my mind that there's so much more information out there. But how are people disseminating the difference between a lie and the truth? OK, so I talk about this all the time and it's it goes very, very deep. And I'll take you back to I believe it was like 1932, 1933, uh, Bern, Switzerland. Uh, with the, which was a famous trial where they put the uh, the publishers and the writers of the book, The Elders of Zion, on trial and actually got a judgment on it because it was the worst case of dissemination of anti-Semitic tropes and blood libels, which basically was like the Mein Kampf of, of the day. And um, it's that dissemination that basically is what needs to be done with the SJP because what they do is when um, – when new students arrive on campus, they'll order, they'll basically go with their indoctrinating material and they'll go knock on their door and literally hand them the literature and start fucking preaching to them the very first day. And this literature is the worst propaganda similar to the elders of Zion, which is basically, you know, Israel's uh, same shit that UNRWA teaches in school, you know. Israel, uh, you know, illegally occupied, you know, they attacked, they committed atrocities, you know, they want to, you know, ethnically cleanse and genocide, apartheid and blockade and, and all the other buzzwords that they use all the time. But what it comes down to is the teachings and the history account of two different books. One is the accurate account from Benny Morris, the birth of the Palestinian refugee problem, 1948 to 1945, 1948 to 1949, the second volume, the extended edition for all you motherfuckers who want to be like, oh no, he didn't read that one. Yes, I did. Oh, and the hundred years Palestinian war by Rashid Khalidi, who is one of the professors of Middle Eastern studies at Columbia University, also the grandson of Dr. Khalidi, the, uh, the famous Palestinian, um, oh, he was really Egyptian, um, Palestinian elite who started a lie at the end of uh, uh, the Battle of Deir Yassin, which basically forced the Arabs to leave their homes. There was a, a ma- there was, I mean, it's very, very highly contested. It wasn't a massacre. It was a battle, you know, and, you know, some shit happened. But lo- we're not here to talk about that. Dr. Khalidi said, this is a chance to establish the caliphate, the call to, for jihad. If we create this lie saying that, the Haganah or the, you know, Isra- I mean, it was really like the Aragorn and the Lehi. Um, the yeah. Haganah w- didn't have anything to do with Dir Yassin. <clears throat> They're going to say that they killed babies and raped pregnant women. And this this news disseminated to the, all the Arab, you know, all the Arab villages uh, by radio and by newspaper. And the villagers got scared. They believed the lie. And what did they do? It didn't cause everyone to, you know, join forces and, and a global caliphate of all, you know, the uh, the Arab nations to come and and attack and vanquish Israel or what what what's soon to be Israel, um, or once it was established. But it drove the people to leave their homes because they didn't want to get killed or or pregnant women raped because of this lie that was told. So it it comes down to what's the truth and what's not. Hundred years Palestinian war by somebody whose grandfather already started the lies and the propaganda, or the guy who actually was allowed into the archives, into the Israeli archives, British archives, French archives, UN archives, American archives, to really do the work, the work and the research on the adequate account of what actually happened. Who are we gonna believe? 
Joe Paul, let me. What is the craziest story that's happened to you in this in this little journey you've taken? The craziest story. Hmm. There's a couple of them. I mean, so there's a like like a super super famous um like hip hop mogul. Um, and I was you know kind of kind of on really really good terms and friendly with a with his older brother, and we um we saw eye to eye on a lot of things. And then all of a sudden he started like sneak dissing, like in my DMs, like, you know, you know, Israel did this and, you know, the Jews did that and this and that. And I was like, wait, wait. I was like, what the fuck is going on here? And it was like, it was like out of a fucking, it was like out of a movie. I was like, I was like, is this really happening right now? I was like one as like somebody in hip hop and somebody from New York, when somebody like tries to, I don't know, I guess, you know, challenge you, your, your manhood is like, wait a second. Like, who the fuck does this motherfucker think he is? Like. Like, he don't even know me like that to be talking like that. Like, in fact, you know what? Let's go. Yeah. But so the craziest thing was, it's like, it started with him. And then it was like, then another and another and another. Till all of a sudden, I'm ready to fucking strap up arms and literally go create some atrocities myself. I was about to restart the Leahy and really show them what Jewish terrorism is all about. So, but the, I, if I have to like pinpoint like the craziest thing. Actually, we could we could do craziest in a, in a good way. Um, sure. <clears throat> the um interpretation the the, the, the combat anti semitism event that happened. There was a for people that, that are watching. There was a, a a big influencer event. The top two hundred and fifty influencers from all around the world uh, basically were flown in uh, and put up in hotels. You know, to for this big facade of um i mean i think it was a waste of money i mean uh, whoever, it was a huge it, waste of money it was very boring i did not enjoy it and i was happy to be invited uh well i'm glad i'm glad you were invited so i was not happy because i was not invited and i felt like i felt kind of kind of slighted i was like wait a second i was like not to say like yo you know who the fuck i am like i mean I, but at the same time i'm like do you know who the fuck i am like i mean there's no jew that's like me in the fucking universe. I know because I've looked for them and I can't find them. Like there are similar ones that, that, that are close, but no one even comes close. I have a twin brother uh, and he's not, not even like me. There's not, there's nobody, there's no Jew like you. There is no Jew like you. What? There's no Jewish rapper, all the Jewish, I don't care what they say. You're the, you're one of the toughest Jews I've ever met. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. And all you right? know, it's crazy that you use the word tough Jew. You know, there's a, there's the most famous, one of the most famous producers of all time has a company named Tough Jew. But meanwhile, he doesn't do jack fucking shit to stand up for the Jews. Well, so, that's not. Tough so, Jew Mr. Mr. Mean, so, Mr. Storch, uh, I think you need to start opening your mouth to the Jewish people, especially when your company's name is Tough Jew. And if you have a problem with that, I'm in Staten Island. Come see me. Nah, I love you. Come on. Um, so, the, so the, we want, I want to have lunch and bagels and we'll get some food. Yeah, whatever. Well, we'll make a song, you know, make a hit, whatever we got to do. <clears throat> So to combat anti-Semitism, you know, um, I put out, I put out a post and I went kind of deep with it. I went, you know, to the, to the origin of Theodore Herzl and the, you know, the, the, and people who don't know, Theodore Herzl is the modern father of Zionism. And even though Zionism was not, you know, created by him, it was, uh, it was, uh, brought to the forefront because of him and his vision of, of the Jewish people, like in the early literature and the pamphlets that he would pass out was like these like strong, like, you know, like Jewish people that were going to yeah, work yeah. the land and and are self-sufficient, not these weak, trembling knees, you know, of of northern Europe that, you know, were been chased around from the pogroms of 1880 to 1920, you know, which, you know, led to like 1400 separate different, you know, incidents of violence, which historians put the death count anywhere between 150 to 250,000 people died in those 40 years of pogroms. So the early Zionism the idea is also that we should have a homeland. That's really what he promoted also. Exactly. He he knew he he was the most clairvoyant person of all times to foresee the fact that Jews were going to be persecuted on a level where they needed a place of refuge is like something from something from God. So <clears throat> so when I put out this post and I said, I'm what Theodore Herzl envisioned. I'm the person that's going to lead the weak Jews out of fucking weakness in, in, and obscurity into feeling to be a proud Judean warrior that's going to fight for our existence on this earth. And the fact that I'm not invited to this thing, it's pretty fucked up. And they saw it. And the next morning, I got the invite. 
Good. Now, now it, it is. It does feel a little disingenuous because it's like, yo, well, why don't you invite me from the beginning? I know I got a presence, you know, that's out there that you definitely seen. So it's like, and the fact that I'm so unique in what I do, not that like, you know, I'm like, yo, I'm the fucking shit. You smell me, I, but it's just people need to see a Jew like me instead of envisioning somebody like a rabbi from Crown Heights or, you know, the Hasidic with the, uh, with the, you know, the payas and, and, and the curls, because the vision of what they think Jews are is not me and it needs to change. Well, that's now, the not, whole thing. And, and I'm not trying to say that like, like I'm the best Jew, look at me, you know, but I'm a great representation of the Jew that you should think about when you think of, in your mind, who are the Jews? What kind of well, Jews are out there? And that well, we can't be pushed around anymore. Yeah, well, the whole thing, the whole concept is, that I have one more question for you. Uh, the whole concept that I see it is, if you find a hippie Jewish person in the, in the U.S., they're very weird. But if you find a, a, a hippie in Israel, it's like normal. So the whole concept of Jewish diaspora Jews versus the, the, the Jews that live in the, in the homeland is Israel, it's a very different type of Jew. And I think right now we really need to create them and create a, a unity between everybody that these are Jews in general. We have these Jews, we have those Jews, we have this Jew, we have that Jew. And that's the Eitan Shataya who came on the, one of our earlier podcasts had that concept. I'm that Jew because there's just so many different types of Jews. We're money Jews. You're rapping Jews. We're all Jews, but we all have that same inbred understanding of each other. You have these tough moments in your life and you say all the time that you've been screwed so many times and that now other people don't have to. What was what would be one of the defining moments in your life that allowed you to be so resilient and fight when there's so much adversity against you? Uh that's just the New York toughness. And I know that that's, and that's not a cop out or an excuse, like just to, you know, give you a simple answer, but it's like, I mean, it's not like I had such a tough upbringing where like I was being picked on all the time or anything like that, but I was a, I was a short shit or vert vertically challenged, as I like to say, you know, growing up. So it's like, you know, uh, so people would try to pick on me and it's like, if I didn't stand up for myself, then, you know, I'd probably ha feel pain because, you know, they would hurt me and I don't, I don't want to feel pain. So I need to stand up for myself. and you know, for the longest time, I always felt that I was a little bit different, you know, than everyone else. And that's not some supremacy or some like godlike, you know, complex, but, you know, address me as Yahweh from now on. Um, it's a joke, by the way. You know, I should, I'm sorry. Um, um, I just felt like it was, a, it, it was a chance to, it was a chance to let me be who the fuck I want to be. And if you're going to challenge the existence of my people or, the identity of who I am or who I know that we are, then I'm going to have to push back and I'm going to have to teach you a thing or two. And not, not, so, not so to speak, you know, with my fists or anything like that. And if it comes to that, you know, sure. But it's more about getting to the point where you're willing to at least listen to an understanding. If you're just like, if you just shut down and you're or you already have your mind convinced and you're fully indoctrinated, I won't even bother. Then it's like, let's just fight. Because obviously what I say and the truth has, has no bearing on this. So you're going to disagree. I'm going to disagree. We might as well just put our fists up and then maybe we'll shake our hands afterwards or we'll walk away. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. It, um, it's no, forever it's actually, evolving it, and changing. It's that's actually, what I can say. It's, it, uh, honestly, it actually makes a lot of sense because it makes a lot of sense of why you're able to stand up so strong for the Jews because you've been standing up for the Jews for so long. And you haven't been vocal about it, but you've been vocal on the one to one. Now you just said, you know, I've been yeah, vocal. You're standing one -to -one. up for yourself. Now you're standing. And now you're standing up for yourself. Up for you're, sta you're standing 7th. up for yourself and everybody. That event of October seventh touched everybody across the world, regardless of with the payas from Crown Heights or someone like yourself, someone like us. It touched everybody. Touched everyone. Let well, me let me let no me ask problem. you a question. Yeah. Do you think? Don't take questions. I, I hope I don't get in. Uh, trouble with people for saying this. Do you think that the people in our administration have seen the 43 minute tape? No, no, I don't think they have. Why do you, th why do you think that they have not seen it? Uh, because I don't think that they want, number one, I don't think they can emotionally handle it. That says a lot. That says a lot. I, I don't think that they're, that they're emotionally tough people because really you need to have like I, I could see the 43 minute tape. I could see it because I've 
been to the army. I've seen some stuff, and that's fine. Oh, you were in the army. Th thank you for your yeah. service. I really appreciate yeah, of it. Of course. Um, so, so, and like as an American by myself, so I could see that in the Israeli army, not the American. In the Israeli army, of course. Well, thank, the Jewish thank, army. Thank, thank you for your service, Am Israel Chai. Am Israel Chai is right, but I, I don't think that they have. The, so this is my whole concept. So, but I think there's a reason why I'm asking it, that, yeah. and, and I'll get to it. And you've already answered. So, so you, so you, so you can see that they do know that this tape exists, and they're consciously not watching it because they don't think that they're morally equipped or, or like mentally, mentally stable enough yeah, to well, actually handle that. I, I don't agree well, with that. I think well, they've seen it. I think it's impossible not to have seen it. I, 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 so I will say that I will say this. Regardless of political affiliation, we try to keep everybody's views different and open to all opinions. But I, I feel that the current administration right now does not have a lot of life experience as opposed to why is Trump so popular? Because he has a lot of life experience and very little political experience. So it's like, who do I look to follow when it comes to a rabbi? I look to follow a rabbi that didn't just grow up religious, go to yeshiva and then go to and, and then become a rabbi. I follow the rabbis that go. That committed I, the I went, robbery when they were younger and, you know, yeah, went like to prison, real, reformed, like, and now, you know, now they're a new person. Even, correct. So, so I don't feel that the current administration has had some real life experience. That's when it, when it, it that's where the problem is. It's like when people say like, oh, well, she's going to be great for jobs. She's never created a job in their life. Trump was very good with jobs because he knew how to create. Why Bloomberg was so popular. Bloomberg was so popular because he know, knew how to create an economy. So I don't think that they've actually been able to see war and see this stuff in real life to be able to handle it and know how to react from that and not be be biased pro whatever and pro whichever side so i, I don't think the life experience for them for the current administration's there okay next question how many times do you think that and now this is not a slight i'm, I'm just i'm gonna i'm gonna do the, the candace owens approach i'm just asking a question I'm just saying, like, look, we can't ask questions. So, and I said the Jews were. Stolen. So, uh, yeah. So, Kamala's daughter in law, how many times do you think that she's pulled out her TikTok and showed some sort of propaganda to her mother, or to her stepmother, and said, look, this is what the, the Jews are doing to the Palestinians? Because she has raised the fund, you know, $8 million for Gaza, which is. Yeah. Which, which is I don't a, think it's a, a, daughter, the stepdaughter. It's probably many, many people in the no, but, the, but I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I've come back and said. No, and, and, and I, I, know and I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying, Joe Paul. I think I think a lot. There's been a lot of internal debates at home, and it's right inside. She has like this cancerous inside. Um, I don't even think she's Jewish because I, I don't know if Doug's first Doug, wife. Well, uh, well, I mean, technically, he's Jewish, so I, I know that she has not embraced. You know, she's one of those as a Jew, Jew, and I'm not, yeah. and I don't want to like criticize people. Listen, everyone is free to do what you want. Like it, it's from a more, I was t having a conversation with my friend the other day from an outsider looking in a, just from a moral standpoint, you want to peace and the death and the destruction, but you don't know the little nuances and everything that is involved within well, this. That's, that's, that's a life experience thing. You know how to take this stuff and push back on it. That's what I find is a big issue. That's why Trump, so, I think, is so popular in some regards and so not popular in some others. He doesn't have the polished political feeling because he, he hasn't been brought up in that. He has that similar vibe to you, and people hate that. And he talks with his mouth. He says what he thinks because that's what you have to do to survive on the streets. But to survive in books, which is very common right now, to, I, I find it very different. I agree. I agree. But anyway, Joe Paul, um, tell us how people can find you. How can people get connected with you? Um, how can people learn from you? I mean, you you, you taught us stuff today. It's, oh, thank it's, you. I appreciate that. And when you said, how can people get in touch with you? It's just, uh, I might date myself. Maybe your father will, will get this reference. So uh, when uh, in, in Rocky one, uh, he's like, yeah, I don't got a phone. It's like, you know, uh, well, well, what if I want to call my brother? It's like, you know, what if, uh, what if someone wants to get in touch with me? It's like, oh yeah, no, we just open the window. Hey, yo, police, I'm out with your sisters. I'll be back later. So if you want to get in touch with me, just lift up your window and call and I'll be there. But now you can find me at, uh, at I am Joe Paul. Uh, YouTube and Instagram, please uh, check out my podcast, the Verify Podcast. I 
uh, was very, very big on doing only hip hop personalities. And I used all the, you know, the famous people that I was friends with for the past 20 years. And we, we had a great run, but now I only highlight outstanding people in the Jewish community or people that are sticking up for the Jews or for Israel. And I teach a whole bunch of history. So if you want to get these bars and get this knowledge, you know, the right knowledge. And I, for, just for context, I watch everything from the opposing side as well. So I'll watch the Al Jazeera's. I'll read the Mark Lamont Hills, the Noam Chomowski's, the Norman Finkelstein's. You know, the I'll learn all of the shit that they're disseminating. So this is where I know where I can shatter their fucking falsehoods with some actual truth. But yeah, I am Joe Paul. I, I, actually, I, I, pre- I appreciate you guys having me. I do. I do the same thing with Joe Paul. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. I hope uh, I hope you got some color today. This was probably the, our highest cursed podcast and most vulgar podcast not probably this is by far the highest there is no second to you ah, i think somebody oh, sorry Shit. it's okay ah, I know. Ah, you haven't had anybody been... else smoking on the podcast either no no we had one guy matan parrots was smoking on this podcast but he was talking about how he quit so thank you joe paul for coming on i called you joe at the beginning but i'm finishing with the joe paul because we love you we care about you and really appreciate what you're doing so thanks everybody for listening i um, love we'll you, see you on the next one. bring them home i'm israel Kai.